The uh, basic gist is that we have a, a, an underlying common culture that gradually moves in different directions in each center. So let's begin. The obvious place to begin is Jerusalem, which you've heard about before, apparently. The most, f most important, ooh, wait, what's happening? Most important site in Jerusalem uh, is the church that was built by, um, but was I should say, was begun uh, by Constantine, Constantine on the site that includes Golgotha and the tomb of Jesus. So in Constantine's time, they destroyed the Temple of Venus and they started digging. And according to Eusebius, the great historian, church historian of the early fourth century, the cave just sort of rose out of the ground like Christ rising from the dead. It was perfectly obvious that that was the correct tomb. So this thing was built over it. In the time of Egeria in 383 or so, there were three psalms sung before the tomb, and then the bishop read one of the resurrection accounts, uh, and that was the core of the, uh, the resurrection vigil. And as it survived in the Byzantine liturgy or the Greek Orthodox liturgy, it's now down to, oops, basically one verse of one psalm, the last verse of Psalm 150, let every breath praise the Lord. The, uh, the reading, the music is sort of like punctuation. And the most important punctuation, of course, is the period. Da 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 dum, or just da 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 or da 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 whatever, but it's always that note. That's the period. And the less important pauses, that are more like uh, commas or semicolons, are lower than that. So there's this alternation between the less important pauses and the more important pauses. So there's alternation back and forth like that. So, so try to hear that. I'll try to point them out. There's a period right there. You know, we don't have melodies from Nigeria's time. Uh, we do have melodies in both the Latin and Greek traditions that may go back to Jerusalem. It was quite a complicated place ecclesiologically. And one of the things about it is that there were many different kinds of churches, not just many churches, but different kinds of churches. The most important were the great basilicas, and most of those were staffed by monasteries. Uh, there were, in the case of St. Peter's, there were four monasteries uh, right nearby, and it was the monks who did the services. So the services in these were very monastic. And there were also cemetery or grave churches that were built over catacombs or graves of martyrs. They were all outside the city the Roman custom was to keep, keep everything having to do with death outside the city. So that's where the cemeteries were and the great graves of the martyrs. Uh, so, but they also played a role in the uh, Roman uh, liturgy because the, the pope went around, the bishop of the city went around every year through a cycle, annual cycle going through all the most important churches um, and that's what we call stational liturgy because the Latin word for the church of the day was statio, uh, from a stopping place in, you know, a station in English today is a stopping place. The stopping place in the procession where the mass was held was known as the statio. One of the most famous of all Roman churches, San Clemente, uh, has this intact 
clerical musical structure here where the clergy and the choir presumably perform the liturgy. And art historians call this a scola cantorum. But the scola cantorum originally was the name of the choir, the school of singers. The choirs were boys, but they had grown-ups, paraphoniste, that's grown-up men, who sang along with them. And paraphonista is a word that doesn't exist in Greek, but it's a Greek word that was used in Latin. And it means they stand next to, they, they, they sound next to. So they stood next to the boys and they sang alongside the boys. The ancient Vespers for Easter week, uh, in what we call Old Roman chant, which is the local Roman variation that may be older than um, Gregorian chant. Um, on the first day of Easter week, it was sung in the Lateran and in three stations. But anyway, the first station, um, the Easter Vespers, they moved around. They went into three different places. They started out in the Basilica, which looked something like this. Um, then they went into the baptistry. Baptistry, like many baptistries, is an, an uh, octagonal building. One of the things that's interesting about this, one of the things that seems archaic rel relative to Gregorian chant, is that it, it's actually set up for alternation between the adults and the boys. This is a guy's edition of the text. It's all in Latin. But it says, the scola comes together with bishops and deacons in the major church at the place where the crucifix is, and they begin Kyrie eleison. Then they come before the altar. There's a lot of footnotes. And they sing stuff. Um, when the Kyrie eleison is finished, the archdeacon uh, signals to the leader of the scola, and he bowing begins Alleluia and the first psalm, Latin Psalm 109, English Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord. So here's how it works. There's a what we call an antiphon, which is like a refrain. And since this is the Easter season, the words are just Alleluia. Then there's the, the verses of the psalm, but all they give you in the manuscript is just the beginning, first two words, and the ending. Uh, and that's all you need, because any church singer in those days knew the psalms by heart, uh, sang, them every, sang all of them every week, and uh, knew, the tunes, but knew the tunes by the heart. It's a very simple tune. What they do in the recording Although the manuscript says the primicherius, the leader, the adult leader of the choir, says the antiphon, what they do in the recording is they have the boys sing it. The boys sing it, then the men sing the first verse of the psalm, then the boys sing the antiphon again, then the men sing the, the last verse of the psalm, which is glory be to the Father, gloria patri. That's because it's a recording, they don't want to bore you. But it should have been the whole psalm. If, if it was in the actual ritual, they would have sung the entire psalm, every verse to the same music, uh, possibly with the antiphon at the end of every verse. OK, now what comes next is a lot more complicated. Um, most of the uh, chant that we've heard up till now, both the Latin and the Greek, is basically just one or, one or a few notes per syllable. But now we're getting some of what we call melismatic, which is many notes per syllable. You can see just by looking. And then we have this funny thing that's very unusual. Um, it seems to be a signal from the adult to the children about what they're supposed to sing. 
So here he just says, sing the next verse, which is uh, from then to forever. And then the scola actually sings it. Here it's just syllabic, it's just one note. But then the scola sings it with the actual melody, which is a lot more complicated. This is very typical of old Roman chant, where a lot of chants you might think it would just be note, 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 like ele vaverun flumina. But in old Roman chant, you, you get things like this. So you'll hear that when the boys sing it. It's also very beautiful because of what it actually sings, of the waters that are lifting themselves mm. up. So you have really go almost like picture. Uh, well, you could. Uh, that might be so, but but they do this on every text or many texts. I mean, I I, I don't know that there's an intention to sort of illustrate the words in music. Now, there's the adult reminding them what the next verse is. So uh, that's much more elaborate and longer lasting than the Gregorian version. And it does have that um, alternation between the boys and the adults that, sh that shows that this really was for the Roman Scola Cantorum, uh, not just for, for any group of singers. There's another recording, the same, the Latin, the Latin Alleluia, by a different choir, they're trying to make it sound like modern Byzantine chant. Do you, do you want to hear that, or sure. just a moment of it? Yeah, sure. Or, all right. Well, um, so one difference, it's all, it's all men, like most modern Byzantine choirs. It's, um, it's slower, it's sort of more, uh, kind of forceful, uh, and it introduces drones. Uh, uh, drones are very common, and you, know you know what I mean by a drone? Somebody holds a long note in the bass. Um, they're normal in modern Byzantine chant, um, but in my opinion, they're only a, a few centuries old. I don't think it's a really ancient thing. So I don't think that would have, you would have had that in the 12th century or the 10th century or the 8th century or, uh, or anything like that. But it is, uh, Could you tell us a couple of things just to situate this? Yeah. About what is Marcel Paris's approach and why this Byzantinizing aspect to his music, to his recording of music? And second, if you can tell us a little bit more, why do you think that the drones are recent, rather recent, rather than Byzantine? Because well, we had discussion up to this point about drones, and so... Well, somebody told you that they're ancient? Well, I think Alex Lingus is very close, I would say, to Marcel Paris's uh, approach, and working uh. All right, so he thinks they're ancient? I think it's unfair of me to say what he thinks, but okay. so far I haven't seen this question so uh, from. Okay, well, first of all, there's a certain amount of recent development. In very recent publications of Byzantine chant, they actually tell you what pitch to drone on. That started in the 20th century. So, if you go back any older than that, it doesn't tell you what the drone is you have to know. So there's already uh, you know, some, a way that it's become more firm in the 20th century than it was before. Uh, second, if you go back to early recordings, like from the 1920s, um, you get things that are closer to what I think the origin is, which is this. The, um, 
the original tradition in both Latin and Greek churches was that this, you sing from memory and not from books. And around the 15th century, it became common in the Western church for people to sing from books. And if you've ever seen these humongous manuscripts where we're going and chant, the reason they suddenly get very large is so that a whole choir can read them. And if you go back to the 10th century, they're actually very tiny, the manuscripts. Uh, you couldn't it's hard to imagine reading one by candlelight. You know? But um, what they did in the Eastern Church uh, was they had a prompter. It was usually a boy. And the boy would read the text but not sing the melody. And, and that became the drum. So uh, while the choir might be singing, um, Alleluia, ah, 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 the boy might just be singing, Alleluia, like that. You know. And that's what turned into the drone. And, and you can hear that in early, the, the first recordings of Byzantine chant. You can still hear people doing that. Um, so I think it comes from the, the, uh, the prompter. Uh, and in the 19th or 20th century, it started to be seen as a musical element. It started to be treated as something that has a musical value in its own right. But before that, um, I don't think it was seen that way. And however, the use of a prompter does go back centuries. So that, um, if you want to count that as a drone, then the drone does go back to at least the late Middle Ages, at least the 15th century. Um, but a drone as a musical element, I, th I think is probably quite recent. Was that Laszlo Dobbs I singing the other? Yeah. The first one? Yeah, and... It struck me that that's a plausible way to sing that music, whereas the Paris isn't very plausible because it's, it's, all, it's so extended anyway that to extend it in performance is <laughs> well, of course. on the other hand, if you're, if you have all day and it's the high point of the year, you know, um, can we say that they didn't add ornamentation in the in the Latin West? So, um, you know, and it partly depends on where you're coming from. If you're coming from. Uh, you know, an Eastern perspective, it seems normal to do it in an Eastern way. And, <coughs> and Perez may be overstating it, but he has a point that Rome in the early Middle Ages, in the 8th, 9th century, was closer to Byzantium. You know, they've, they've moved away. The, the first half of the 8th, the first half of the 8th century in Rome is sometimes called the era of the Greek popes when you had popes who were actually born in Syria or in the various places in the East and, and uh, spoke Greek. Is it possible to address the question of uh, the identity of the East that is copied? Because we, you suggested that it could be Constantinople, but given some of the Greek monastic communities that are mm -hmm. in the 7th and 8th centuries in Rome, they usually come from Palestine, Syria right. and Palestine. So what is the evidence that uh, leads you in one way vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem, Syria, Palestine? There's not a lot of evidence for what kind of Greek liturgy was done in Rome, but when there is, it seems to me to point to Palestine rather than to, uh, to Constantinople. However, the, the possible exception might be the papal liturgy. Yes. Uh, and what I find a very compelling uh, approach in this material as an art historian is the type of uh, the, how the musical design of a piece taps into socially shared imagination. And today we have two examples. Uh, we cannot surmise from that that this is intentional. But for instance, in Psalm 92, the melody of rising mm -hmm. out of the waves and then acquiring, mm -hmm. moving to a crescendo, mm -hmm. this is very expressive visually, in a sense. Not that it has to be visible, but visual. It works with visual figures. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens with Christos and Esti. It's one of the hymns that I absolutely love. 
listening and the way it anesti is the one that you hit the high note yeah. and then you have the sense of descent and yeah. then you have a sense of rising up when he's taking from the mimosy from the tombs yeah the dead. so can you direct places where musicologists approach this material about the visual imagination that musical composition triggers to possibly open up this venue of this course well <coughs> Some, uh, in some periods, there's no question that music is trying to imitate ideas or, or, or words or sounds of birds or, or whatever. Um, in, in the Middle Ages, it's often hard to know whether something is deliberate or accidental. Like, I could have pointed out that on that verse, Elevave Runt, the melody goes up. Uh, but a lot of verses go up at the beginning, you know. So, was the guy really trying to express elevating, or was, you know, or is it just that that's what a verse does? So I can't, I can't say that they weren't trying to suggest water, but I, I don't want to affirm that they were because I don't actually know. <laughs> 